Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the February 19th, 2020 meeting of the Shawnee Planning Commission. We'll start with roll call. Commissioner Montgomery? Here. Commissioner Roth? Here. Commissioner Peterson? Here. Commissioner Willoughby? Here. Commissioner Beanhoff is absent. Commissioner Busby is here. Commissioner Wise? Here. Commissioner Braley is absent. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Manick? Here. Commissioner Bingham? Thank you. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Consent agenda items one and two are listed under the consent agenda. Unless there is a request to remove an item from the consent agenda, the items will be approved in one motion. Is there a request to remove any items from the consent agenda? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Commissioner Smith. Mr. Chairman, I move the consent agenda be approved as submitted. Thank you. Is there a second? Commissioner Manick? A second. Motion a second to approve the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carried. Thank you. On to new business. The one thing I'd like to suggest we do is we is move item one down below two and three. Would someone care to make a motion? The reason for that is two and three can be dealt with fairly quickly, and there may be people here that are here for the legacy crossing or the sprint monopole deal. Commissioner Manick. I make a motion to move item number one below item number three. Thank you. Is there a second? Commissioner Wise. I'll no second the motion. Motion is second to move item one down below two and three. All in favor say aye. 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 Those nay. Motion carried. Thank you. So item number two, item the B, first item we'll deal with then is Z012002 and pre-plot 032002 legacy, legacy crossing at 7500 block of Clare Road, rezoning and preliminary plat. And my understanding is the applicant is asked to table that until the next planning commission which would be march 2nd is that correct staff that's correct all right commissioner montgomery i move that we table z-01-20-02 and pre plat 03-20-02 legacy crossing at the 7500 block of clear road till the march 2nd 2020 planning commission meeting Thank you. Is there a second? Commissioner Willoughby? Second the motion. The motion is second to move ZO item number two, which is on our sheets as item number two, to the March 2nd Planning Commission meeting. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carried. Thank you. Next is SUP 042002 Sprint Monopole Extension and Tanico location at 12902 Shawnee Mission Parkway, which is a special use permit. Again, they have asked, the applicant is asked to table that to the March 2nd, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. Any questions? Commissioner Montgomery? I move we table 
SUP-04-20-02, the Sprint Monopole Extension and Antenna Co-Location, 12902 Shawnee Mission Parkway to the March 2nd, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. Thank you. Is there a second? Commissioner Roth? Second. Motion is second to move item number three, S SUP-04202, to the March 2nd Planning Commission meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Thank you. So we begin now with uh, the presentation on Wilder Bluff Park. Good evening. Good evening, Neil. Thank you very much for allowing us to come and give a little presentation on Wilder Bluff. I think the last time I came and presented was 2014-2015 for Erford Park. That seems like a little long ago, doesn't it? I think we need to build more parks. So. Um, the excitement, uh, it's very exciting to build, to get out and build something, especially a park in a neighbor, around a neighborhood. Uh, the excitement, it, it has spilled out into the neighborhoods, um, both the east side, west side, south side, all the way around it. Uh, we've had 60 plus at both public meetings. Uh, good conversation, good dialogue, um, good meetings. Uh, and I don't count staff or um, the consultants, even if even if we do live in Chani, uh, we just count uh, the residents that come. So we've had two great meetings. Like I said, um, tonight we've got uh, to, to make the presentation for Wilder Bluff. P.J. Novak is with Confluence, is one of the designers, and Zach Bodine is with SFS, and he is he their, their firm did the the shelter. So with that, I will let PJ come up and talk, and then we'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Neil. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for your time tonight. <coughs> Let me get, Mr. Mr. Dovac, if you'd state your name and address, please, too. It's a PJ Novick, 417 Delaware, Kansas City, Missouri. So by changing them around, I really messed up yeah, their presentation. Minimize the PowerPoint if you can, Mark. It's not finding the presentation on here. There we go. There you go. There we go. You should just be able to slide through it. Perfect. Right? Great. Thanks. Well, first of all, uh, what we're going to do tonight is just briefly go uh, introductions of our team, kind of fill you in on the design process we've done, and then also briefly talk about the goals and the vision, and then we'll talk about the master plan itself. So first of all, our team at Confluence Landscape Architects, we're leading the team we've got as our architectural partner, as uh, SFS Architecture, and civil engineering is being done by GBA, and then we have, this is a little different project for the City Parks Department, we actually have a CM at risk, a construction manager at risk is already on our team, so Citric will be involved with uh, keeping uh, uh, prices going, and then we'll also be the gen basically the general contractor as we start moving forward in the project. design process, we started out, the uh, first thing we did is we did what we call Walk the Park, and that was in early November. So we took uh, all of our, our planning staff and then all the city staff, we got out there for probably a good three hours, walked around the park, we took notes, we got to the high points, we got to the low points, just so we can understand what everything looks like with that. Then we came back to uh, back to, uh, to the community center and we kind of compared our notes with everybody and that kind of gave us a bit of a side analysis. It's really great because then all the, all the city staff and all of us understand their concerns, whether it's uh, you know, drainage areas some views and things like that. So that really was really great. Um, next thing we did was something kind of unique. We worked with we worked with uh, Belmont Elementary, and we actually did a small plan, a site plan of the park. And we gave the kids, each kid in the third grade, I believe, was had little cutouts of playgrounds, of shelters, of parking, of ball fields, and they were able to take that home with their parents. And they had a little little task to put the pieces on the plan where they thought it would be. Uh, Really doesn't get us. It, it doesn't get us any it's, it, much design time. But you know what it does? It gets people talking. You know, every one of those kids goes home, tells tells the parents what they did, what they had to do tonight. Just gets the excitement going. 
when that led to a uh, then a public meeting that we had with uh, out in uh, late November. As Neil said, we had a little over 60 residents uh, come and talk with us. It was a great event. At that event, you can see on the right hand side of the of the slide. Uh, we did we call it just uh, program prioritization. We just had everybody could look at the different types of structures, different types of sporting opportunities, different types of recreational opportunities, and kind of put their favorite their, their tabs on their favorite just to give us an idea of what the community was hoping for. And then our final public meeting uh, was right in the middle of January and we had about 60 to 10 that so I keep going the wrong way. So here's, here's the walk to parks. So that day, we uh, one of the interesting parts is, you know, this is pretty flat, all around residential. We've got some, a creek running through in this area through here. If that's showing up, I go, yeah, you can barely see that. And then as we go to the north, that's some really beautiful prairie, a lot of tall grass prairie in there. It's really, really something. So that kind of told us we want to be careful how we how we work with that on in the planning process. Then as we talked to goals, the main, the main goal we worked with, with the group was really to create a destination unique to the Shawnee area, drawing a multi-generational population uh, for unique experiences while preserving the natural the natural portions of the site. That's what we really started to do. I, I, I believe we've, we've accomplished that. Yeah, this thing is tricky here. Uh, here's, the fir here's the first public meeting. So we had, as we talked about, we went through and looked at uh, potential elements. Actually, the, these are the highest numbers we got. So the, the biggest one we got, we had 39 people saying they wanted native prairie. Then it went down to 37 people who wanted soft trails, so mo mowed grass or maybe gra maybe a, a, a gravel. Bike trails, 27. Hard trails were 22. Western structure within the park was 20, and then a natural water play area received 19 votes. Elementary school, this is, this is uh, on the plan on the right is how we use the kids with that. So they took this home, and then their classes got together with their teachers a couple of days later, and they all drew, literally drew a plan of what the park should look like. So that was really a lot of fun. The teachers really love the idea, and it's really, I think it's a kind of a fun way to get the community engaged. Then we had, a, after this, after we have all of our information, we had what we call a team design charrette. Neil and his, and his staff came down to our office. We spent about two and a half hours just sketching and talking and coming up with some ideas. We came up with two plans out of that. The one on the, ter the, one on the left is called what we call the terrace park concept. That was uh, some grading, so you look down from the shelter, you look down onto the open lawn and through, in through that area. The second was a tree chop adventure, so that really introduced some play structures within the tree canopy out there. And the results of that, um, effort where the treetop adventure was the plan that uh, that we brought forward based on the information from the public and then based on uh, just input from the design team in the city. So we've got our overall master plan. As you can see, this is 55th right through here. And if, uh, so that's where and we're looking north. North is up. So first of all, let's go down the one. There's a, a kind of a high point right here, right at the edge of our property. So we're, we're recommending an overlook. So you can take the pathways up there, just to either a concrete or a wooden platform that you can just kind of sit. Maybe it's, it rises just right at the height of the, of the native grasses that are there. It's just a nice, unique looking uh, opportunity. Item two, as you can see, soft trails are cutting through some of the grasses in through this area. So that would be opportunities where if you're out walking with your kids and maybe they want to take the shortcut through the tall grass and then meet you at the other end, get really get them out in that native grass. Uh, hard trails are the predominant use back here. Those are going to be a minimum eight foot, potentially 12 foot, or potentially 10 foot, excuse me, depending on the, the overall cost. We've got a playground area in through here. We've got a water play area. We've got a shelter with trailhead, open lawn, and then we also have a sledding hill. Now I'll go through some enlargements we've got. So as you can see here in the back, this is kind of an idea of what the overlook would look like. Just, it's just an open platform that would just allow you to rise up kind of level with the, with the tall grasses in the area. Then we got, as you can see, the native prairie. It's a beautiful spot. If you're ever up, if you're ever around there, you can actually kind of you know get in there. It's a, just beautiful sitting back there. They'll have a trailhead at each of the locations. We've got four neighborhood locations, so you'll have the, the traditional Shawnee trailhead that's coming in with that, and then the hard trails and the soft trails. And as we look at the area enlargements, we're going to enlarge kind of the the, the, the heart of the area here. We've got open lawn space in the center. So that's just unprogrammed space, just a nice green irrigated lawn, just the kids go out and play on, might even be some neighborhood events there. As we come into the park, we've got what we call an entry berm, so the idea that we're cutting through, a, like you see in Kansas, cutting through some, some of the limestone to get the roadway in, just kind of a signature entry element. We've got a sledding hill then also, and then we will, at this location, have a crosswalk with a small median for coming across, for coming across 50th history at that point. 
than more area enlargements than we've got uh, in this area you see here that's a synthetic turf uh, hill so the kids can climb up on top on that and it's not you're not going to wear out any grass we've got a playground that is ages typically ages two to five um, then the other, the other side here is kind of the unique portion we've got so we call it treetop canopy so that's a treetop playground we, we say it's for the kids five to twelve but in some of these we've seen you know, adults will do it too, but the kids are in, are in net tunnels, so they climb up, they're, they're amongst the tree canopy in these little forts, and they can't get out, so they have to, you know, go one end to the other, but as you can imagine, climbing through a rope, these rope tunnels on top and looking up, looking down at mom and dad is, is going to be fun for them. Important to, to have some shade in the area, so we've got a shade sail that's over the, uh, what we call the splash pad, and it's a splash pad, uh, it's a splash pad not like you would see in, in other locations, so it's not big primary colored elephants or a big bucket dumping over. It's more actual. This will have water coming out of some, some boulders shooting out of the ground and a little bit of water just about an inch or so deep as it fills up for the kids just to kind of splash in with that. So it's kind of a, kind of a unique way to, to approach that. Zach, you want to take over here? Okay. The architectural components will consist of a single structure um, that'll house a 60-person shelter area, um, a double-sided fireplace that'll interact with the shelter and also a seating area to the east of the shelter, as well as a men's and women's restroom with small utility area. Um, the design of the shelter is uh, really intended to anchor in between the lawn area to the south and the play area to the north and also provide a focal point as you enter the park from the south. Um, this is really accentuated through the roof form that rises up in both of those directions. Uh, screening elements are provided um, both in a trellis that wraps around the south and north ends of the shelter, as well as the louver elements that you can see on the south elevation. Those provide another layer of enclosure in the shelter, as well as some sun shading. Uh, seat walls also wrap around the post bases and provide an additional seating option, as well as help define some of the seating areas around the fireplace and shelter. Uh, primary materials will be wood and stone. The structural frame will be heavy timber or potentially steel configured to have the appearance of timber. Um, limestone cladding will wrap these uh, uh, restroom walls, the fireplace, as well as the seat, seat walls. Uh, lastly, the west elevation facing the parking lot um, could serve as a signage opportunity um, addressing visitors entering the park from the parking lot. And lastly, we have a couple of uh, images here of just quick perspective. So this is uh, obviously taken up. This is as your kind of what you'd see coming into the park. With as Zach said, the the large shelter is through here. So you've got that's kind of looking out onto the Grand Lawn. We got another shot here. So this this is the uh, the natural water play area. So you'd step down into that. You know, just a, a couple of small steps in some locations. Then also we'll have ramping down to get into there. But it's kind of a, an enclosed space there. And lots of fun for the kids to play playing with that. And here's another perspective you can see here. This kind of gets into this is that that turf hill we talked about with a climbing apparatus there. The kids can run up and down the water play area here in the back. There's the shelter with the two-sided fireplace, and then the fire, kind of the fire pit area gathering spot, gathering spot through there. And here's another, as you can see, this is when you're coming into the parking lot, where Zach talked about a, you know, a nice opportunity just to put the name of the park on the side of that shelter. And you can see how the shelter kind of serves two purposes there. Next steps, we've got council approval um, on the 24th, and then we will move into final design, and we're looking at breaking ground on the project uh, midsummer. Any questions? I'd be happy to. Does the commission have any questions for the group? <coughs> Commissioner Willoughby. Uh, a question for Neil, really. When, uh, you know, several events at Erfurt Park with the north wind blowing through that, through the main shelter, mm -hmm. and we talked about, just casually, about some way to block that off, you know, either with a 
with a retractable, you know, vertical awning or something. And and, and if and if this one, like the the part that is on the north side, from like the restroom enclosure to the fireplace, uh, you know, if that's an if that it looks like it faces that's the north side and we might be involved in the same thing where you know in the in the spring or in the late fall if you're trying to do something there you know if that was if if there was a you know some way of doing that both these sites are a little different uh -huh. one's on top of the hill as you know or for as you've been out there uh -huh. always windy right. um uh, the uh, Wilder Bluff is down in a hole, surrounded by a heavy um, that tree line that that runs through the north. It's a very, it's a very heavy hedge, mm -hmm. hedge row. Yeah. Um, the fireplace actually faces east, so it's not north. So I think the the wind at that location, um, okay. it, it, it's kind of it's different than Erford. Okay. All right. Do you agree? Good, thank you. Any other questions for Neil or the rest of the entourage? I have a couple questions, Neil, and that is, is can you tell me how many access points there are to this park? I believe that is... There's five. Five. Yes. And they're from current neighborhoods that are already built out. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Highland Ridge, Ridge what, Highland Estates, you've got... Uh, over there on Apache, the two, the two off of Apache that is more larger yard homes. It's not like Highland Ridge. And then you've got the crosswalk that comes over to um, uh, the Belmont subdivision. Terrific. And the, and the crosswalk on 55th Street is, is fairly important to us because I went through the effort thing. And, uh, and do you know when that crosswalk will be built? In other words, will it be built? Yeah, it will be built with the park. That, with the those parks, are the yes. taken care of. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And it will be just like uh, if you've been on Woodland, you'll have that 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 rescue island is what we call uh -huh. it. So when you do bike or ride, you're always facing online traffic. If you come north and then you you'll bend and you'll face the eastbound traffic. If you come across the street, you'll face the westbound traffic. So you're Terrific. always facing the traffic, so there's a safe. Terrific. So every, almost everyone within a mile of there will have access without having to, will have access to the park without necessarily having to drive there. Yes. That's fantastic. There's, there's Absolutely there's, incredibly good. Yeah. Um, it's a nice location for the fa for the families and, and and the neighborhood. The next park is 2.5 miles, and, and the kids have to cross K7. That's kind of hard for having a eight to nine ten year old. Here, yeah, let's go to the park. We'll ride over there. So to to Garrett, this is a this is a very nice. Uh, this is only two parks on the west side of uh, K7, which is nice. That's terrific, and I'm just glad about the access point and the other stuff being done at the time the park is being built. I mean, that's incredibly good, that uh, the access to the park that way. Uh, another question for you, Matt, is, is on the slide that you were showing the native grass, I noticed there were eastern red cedars in there, which is kind of an invasive species. Mm -hmm. Will you guys, will, during construction, will those be taken out of that area? Yes, we will have a massive um, kind of a honeysuckle, um, wild pear, and yeah, they're all over. Wild pears, huge. which are already there. No the wild pear outnumbers the 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 uh, eastern red cedar, but we'll have a group that will come in identify them. We've got uh, Todd, who who's done some great stuff with GBA. Uh, on the wetlands and, and uh, invasives. So we will look at all those and all those will be cut down um, and keeping the, you know, the, tr the proper trees, the oaks, the, because we want to keep the, you know, you, you want to keep the birds and the, the foxes and the, a lot of people are very sensitive to that, the coyotes, uh, the, the um, deer, so I think, I think there's a lot of animals out there. We want to be very careful with uh, making sure we're not disrupting their homes. So, 
and that's awful. It's wonderful because the the gentleman uh, uh, that owns the 40 acres north of the park for years has done um, all that uh, that farming that he's you put into um, for government CRP. CRP. Thank you. So anyway, he's done a beautiful. I mean, just a beautiful job with a prairie. Um, you know, kind of things that I love, you know, the butterflies and bees that type stuff. And he, it is, it is gorgeous. It's thick. And the best part about it is when the winds come to the north, I get all those seeds in the park. And we've got a very beautiful stand on our property of prairie. So it, 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 will, it will be fantastic for that. And then we will go in very cat gingerly not only putting in the trails and not just driving everywhere and tearing everything up. So that's that north side is going to be very um, watched on uh, the contractor. That's right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Commissioner Manick? Um, first of all, I'd just like to compliment you and the team for what appears to be a well thought out. Mm -hmm. You can slide a lot of places. Oh, yeah. Is yeah. there something you're doing? It's just a hill. I mean, you want you want a hill, you go to Stump Park. Right. Yeah. Park, so. Yeah. Stump Park's got a pretty good hill. <laughs> but, um, uh, the other thing, you just mentioned the gentleman that has the land. North, yes. You said. Yeah. So it's contiguous to the, to the park? We will put no trespass. And I've talked to Chuck. He's a, he's a wonderful man. Um, he's very sensitive to his area because he does get financing uh, from the government. They come out and look at what they what he's done. And so they have to, uh, they kind of monitor being in that type of uh, uh, pro CRP program. Thank you again, uh, that, that program. So we will, we will put up, we don't do fences. So we, but we will put up some, probably some signage that says that's not our property. Oh, right, go up on that hill. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's nice. You go down the river valley, yeah. down the wilder. It's very pretty. And you, you can kind of see the houses over there off of, uh, um, off Clare, the bigger homes. Yeah. Of, um, I just lost the subdivision. Belving. Belving, yeah. So it, it, it's a pretty view. Uh, Commissioner Peterson. I, Second, what uh, Commissioner Menick said, and love the amenities, but it brings me to a question, and maybe the cart before the horse. Um, obviously, the shelter will be available for rentals, for events, family reunions, whatever, and for those events that are having children, um, having the play area that close is convenient, but does it also a reservation encompass that because if you rent the shelter it, does that take those amenities that are so close to the shelter away from the general public or will people just come up and use that perhaps in the middle of an event there's, there's a just level. a curious yeah no there's a level there's you will you'll be able to rent the shelter but the playground is, is separate Okay. So the the, the, the the shelter, the fire pit area, that's all in the rental. It's kind of like the restrooms. It's nice to have the restrooms there, but both people can, both groups can use the restroom. Thank you. Any other questions for Neil or his team? I have one comment, and that, a couple comments, and actually th this looks fantastic. I can understand why people in that area are very excited about it. And as well, they should be because I think it's very well thought out, very easy to get to for all the neighborhoods, and that's just fantastic. So I commend you on that. That's wonderful. And just as a side note, is I believe the one of the former mayors of uh, Wilder is an employee at Shawnee City Hall, by the way. 
that somebody told me it was an urban legend, but I could choose to believe it, and I believe that's the case. Not sure if you're aware of that. Any other questions for the Neil and his team? If not, thank you for your presentation. We appreciate it very much. Do we need, need to make any motion on this at all? This was for informational purposes only. We just wanted to get any questions or comments that you had uh, to the team. It sounds like you're pretty much in agreement with what their, their vision and plan is. And so, no, we just wanted to make sure you were aware of it. And if there was anything major before it went to council, I think Neil wanted input. But it sounds like you're all on the same page. So there's no official action needed. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Neil. Thank you all for presenting it. I may want to change some of the heading that Belmont Park is still at the bottom of that slide. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good point, because that didn't become official until this. Uh, yeah. Right. And we had to get everything to the... No, I so that. Understand. Yeah. And, and civil is spell, misspelled. The I is missing. So I, I caught I that today. I caught that too. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda, yeah, SP... 062002 West Glen Commercial Center at 16605 Midland Drive, facade re facade revision. Staff? Uh, this is honestly something that could have probably been placed on consent agenda, but it's a important enough center. We want to just make you aware of some changes that are going on. Uh, as you all, I believe, are aware, the original center was constructed of tilt-up aggregate-based uh, concrete uh, with purple tile accents, it was it was literally constructed decades ago. It started to show its age and its um, its time period, if you will. The center, this portion that's in orange, has been recently sold and purchased, and the new owner is wanting to uh, upgrade the facade. What they're proposing to do is to provide some synthetic stucco treatments above, uh, tone down the purple roof structure with some um, applied color paint. Uh, and then at the, and some of the accents around the window systems do some concrete stain slash paint uh, in a gray tone. And the cool thing about it at that top of that uh, roof structure, they're going to do some well done accent lighting to, to give the top of the building some character and kind of tie all the structure together. Uh, they will be doing these improvements on all four sides of the structure. And in staff's opinion, it will really update the, the look of the building and, and give it some much needed shot in the arm character. I can tell you too that other portions in the center, as you know, Wendy's went through a model about two years ago, so their building's been upgraded. And you will be seeing an application in the very near future, I believe, for the Hampton to go through an exterior facade remodel too. So with b and now in place, uh, this being upgraded, you're going to start to see the center uh, come into the into the 21st century. With that, I'll stop. Uh, we're supportive of the of the change. We think it's a really nice addition, and will really help to to bring the center um, some some new life. Thank you, Doug. Is the applicant present? Yeah. Do you come forward and state your name and address, please? Andy Fox with Fox Properties. Uh, the address of the center is 16605 Midland Drive, in Shawnee. Thank you. Are you in agreement with staff recommendations? Yes. Thank you very much. Does the commission have any questions for the applicant or staff? Commissioner Wise. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, on, so when you're painting this much metal, mm -hmm. um, you're knowing how old the current finishes are to you, what do you anticipate having to do to make sure that this is, again, I know there's going to be reapplication involved, but do you see any concerns in getting the color to work, taking care of what's already there, the, the older blue or purple that's in place? Right, so it's actually been uh, painted once already, uh, the blue over the purple, and some of the purple is coming through. Um, so we're left with the option of paint or new metal altogether. Uh, unfortunately, new metal is not in my budget, um, and so paint is our, is our best option. So we've consulted with Sherwin-Williams, and they have a commercial-grade uh, oil-based paint that they feel will withstand the weather as good as can be. But we understand paint is going to need to be reapplied at, you know, every three to five years. Um, 
at a minimum of three to five years. So we, we've had some good luck. We've had some bad luck. A good example is the tile shop down at Shawnee Mission Parkway in Neiman. Uh, they've changed their their uh, metal color and they they actually did. I don't know if it was an etch before they applied the paint or if they did a sandblast to get a better adhesion. Right. Uh, and it was just one step extra in the process, and it's lasted, I think, about nine years now without any issues. So we'll work with the applicant to make sure that, that they're right, using the best processes. We are applying a, a, a primer type of scenario, like, like you mentioned, that will help the paint adhere. All right, thank you. So. It's, that's yes, that's right. I think this is just one more lever. For, I, I didn't write it, but I'm guessing that's one more lever to get something done. And the applicants in agreement. They're obviously they're investing money into the center. They want it to look nice from a landscape landscape standpoint, and and I think they've worked with Stephanie to come through those issues in good shape. And I think you're going to see a, a, a completely different picture when this right. is all completed. That's our goal. Out of curiosity, then, did they go back to the original landscape plans or might they submit a new landscape plan? They have the option of putting in the original landscaping uh, plants that were shown. My guess is they'll come up with something new. Um, there may be more drought-tolerant plants uh, now than what we looked at in the 80s when this was originally built. So we'll work with them to make sure that whatever they do is nice and is at least as good as what was there originally. <laughs> Very fine. Thank you, Bill. Any other questions for applicant or staff? Thank you. Hearing no other, we will be in commission discussion then. Okay. Thank you. Hearing no lengthy discussion, would someone care to make a, dis a motion? Hmm? I'm sorry, Brian. Commissioner Roth. I recommend we approve SP 06-20-02 West Glen Commercial Center facade re revisions per staff recommendations. Is there a second? Commissioner Bingham. Motion is second to approve SP 062002 West Glen <laughs> Commercial Center at 16605 Midland Drive facade revision. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Thank you. Moving on next on the agenda is PUD 012002, the enclave of Mill Creek at 16, I'm sorry, 15625 Midland Drive rezoning for planned unit development. Mark? Good evening, Mark Zillstorf for city planning staff. Uh, tonight uh, we have an application for a rezoning and a development plan. And this item, as a reminder to the commission, will require a public hearing. Subject site is located in the south central part of Shawnee. It is located on the south side of Midland Drive, approximately three quarters of a mile east of I-435. The subject property includes four parcels that total 9.4 acres. The parcels are currently zoned a mixture of RS residential suburban, RE residential estates, and AG agricultural. The property is currently developed with a 1,224 square foot single family home built in 1927 and a 480 square foot detached garage. The south parcel adjacent to Little Mill Creek is encumbered with floodplain, as are small portions of the other parcels that make up this property. <coughs> The request is to rezone the property to PUDMR, Planned Unit Development Mixed Residential. The proposed development calls for the demolition of the existing structures on the site and the construction of 30 residential units in six fourplex and three duplex buildings located on either side of a newly constructed public street extending south from Midland Drive. As far as the surrounding zoning, as you can see on these graphics here, Midland Drive is adjacent to the north of the subject property. Properties north of Midland Drive consist of a single family home that is zoned residential estates, a vacant 2.9 acre parcel zone commercial highway, and a 6.3 acre 17 lot single family residential development on property that is zoned planned single family. Property to the east of the subject property is developed with a single family home that is zoned residential suburban. Little Mill Creek and its associated floodplain is located to the south. 
and a single family home uh, on a lot zoned residential estates is located to the west. As far as the city's future land use guide, uh, within the comprehensive plan, uh, it designates the subject site as appropriate for medium density residential uses with park and open space uses for those areas within the floodplain adjacent to Little Mill Creek. The comprehensive plan defines medium density residential uses as between 5.01 and 10.0 dwelling units per acre. This particular development has an overall density of 3.2 dwelling units per acre, which is below the minimum density threshold. The plan provides approximately 44% of the total area is open or green space. The back or the south portion of the property that is within the floodplain will remain undeveloped, providing private open space for this de development's residents. A public recreational trail easement is being dedicated to the city in this area to allow for a possible future construction of a public recreational trail along Little Mill Creek. For these reasons, planning staff believes the proposed plan complies with the intent of the comprehensive plan. As far as surrounding impact, the rezoning itself should have little if any detrimental effect upon the surrounding area. Although this is a multifamily residential development, the overall density at 3.2 dwelling units per acre is within the range found in low density detached single family developments. The development is essentially self-contained with all driveways feeding onto a public street extending off of Midland Drive. The increase to traffic will be minimal as Midland Drive, which is classified as an arterial street, has the capacity to handle the traffic created by this development. Approving a rezoning request will not negatively affect the health and welfare of the community. The property will continue to be used for what is essentially low density residential uses with an abundance of preserved open space. The existing adjacent homes will be buffered with a 30 foot peripheral boundary setback and the proposed number of residential units will not overburden the public service provisions in this area. And staff would like to point out a similar residential development known as Cypress Point Villas is located approximately one quarter of a mile to the west on Midland Drive. Cypress Point Villas was constructed in 2003 and contains 26 residential units in duplex and fourplex configurations along a single cul-de-sac off of Midland Drive, very similar to this project. It has an overall density of 4.6 dwelling units per acre, and the city has not received any complaints for Cypress Point Villas in regards to adverse impacts on traffic or supporting infrastructure. Furthermore, based on conversations between planning staff and the original developers of Cypress Point Villas, who I might point out still reside in that development, um, according to them, it has been a very successful subdivision with often a wait list to purchase units when they become available. Preliminary plat included with the development plan indicates that the residential units will be of a townhome type ownership with all units being individually owned and all grounds being tracks under common ownership. Tracks A and B will consist of the ground immediately around the residential buildings that include the driveway and the yard areas. Tracks C and D will consist mostly of native vegetation within dedicated stream corridors and will be common areas of open space for use by the development. As far as the architecture, uh, the duplex and fourplex villas will, are all of a similar single story ranch style architectural design. Each unit will include two car garage, full basement, and three to four bedrooms. All of, all of the villas will be of a similar design using durable building materials such as uh, stucco and stone veneer and 30 year architectural composition shingle roofs. Um, and we'll have an earth tone color palette. As you can see, the duplex and the fourplex buildings are essentially the same design. The difference being is the way they're laid out on the site. As far as area and bulk requirements, all area and bulk requirements have been met. Uh, the plat contains 9.4 acres, which provides a land area of 13,660 square feet for each dwelling unit, which exceeds the minimum of 2,800 square feet per residential unit that is required. Minimum spacing between the buildings is shown to be 20 feet or greater, which meets or exceeds the separation requirements. Primary 
access to the property as noted before will be from a public street extending south from Midland Drive. Midland Drive is a designated arterial. There will be no residential driveway access to Midland Drive. And the, the public street, which is known as Almond Drive, will terminate at a, in a cul-de-sac. And the residential units will be accessed by way of private shared driveways off of the interior public street. Public sewers and all utilities are available to serve this area. As far as parking, residential uses require two, point, uh, two parking spaces per dwelling unit. The required number of on-site spaces for the 30 dwelling units is 60 spaces. Each unit, as I mentioned before, has a two-car garage. And we'll have a full-width driveway in front of each garage that is a minimum of 20 feet long. So with the combination of garage and driveway parking spaces, 120 spaces have been provided for this development. As far as landscaping goes, um, the, the applicant did provide a landscape plan for the development as required. Uh, the, plan, the proposed plan shows a combination of deciduous and evergreen trees used to meet the street tree requirements. Uh, the tree species shown on the plan satisfy the provisions of the species tree mix requirement and all plant sizes indicated also meet minimum size requirements. The landscape plan does indicate pres preserving stands of dense existing trees and vegetation on the south side of the property to meet the usable open space requirements. While the code allows for and staff is in agreement with the use of preserving these trees to meet the requirements of the code, the applicant will be required to submit a revised landscape plan that includes an existing tree inventory to show that the number and size of the trees to be preserved on site will meet the minimum requirements. Uh, the revised landscape plan should also provide for foundation plantings around each of the buildings and driveways as well and has increased the landscaping buffer along the east and west sides in the area of the proposed homes and indicate that all disturbed areas uh, will be sodded. Uh, the revised landscape plan will be provided along with the final plat when it comes back in for a final plat. So you'll see in your staff report, we do have an open item regarding the revised landscape plan. It's not, it's not really an open item for discussion per se, it's more just to point out that it is a requirement when they come back in with the final plat that we will be expecting a revised landscape plan. As far as the project amenities, the city's multifamily amenity policy suggests that developments of this size provide two amenities for the development's residents. Um, the applicant is providing a walking path, a seating area, a community outdoor grill, and a dog area. In addition to these physical amenities, the property includes nearly 3.3 acres of passive open space for the residents. The development will also be maintenance provided, including mowing, shrub trimming, snow removal, and trash pickup service. A public recreational trail easement is also being dedicated to the city to allow for a possible con future construction of a recreational bike trail along Little Mill Creek. And staff is of the opinion that these amenities are appropriate for this type of development and are in conformance with the city's amenity policy. The subdivision is subject to the Park and Recreational Land Use Fund, uh, open space fees in the amount of $400 per residential unit. Uh, shall be paid at the time of building permit. Uh, this subject, this development is also subject to the excise tax uh, for platting and real property. And I'd like to point out in your staff report that you had before you, um, there is a correction to this section. Uh, some of the areas that uh, in your report indicate that are subject to the excise tax uh, was an oversight on staff's part and we went back and looked at it and have corrected that. So portions of the property were are previously or are currently platted as hall gardens, and we have previously platted property. A property that is platted currently, we we do not uh, we do not charge an excise tax on that portion of the property. So only the unplatted piece that's in the back near the floodplain will be subject to that excise tax. So the amount that you see in your staff report is significantly more than what would actually be owed. Um, and just to clarify. Uh, the estimated excise tax for this development would be $25,567 as calculated on an area roughly of 118919 And I believe your staff report indicates about an $85,000 excise tax. So a uh, significant reduction on there. And the applicant's been made aware of that correction. Um, I will say without going into all the detail, all the engineering uh, requirements have been uh, reviewed and vetted out by our staff. Um, 
and all the requirements have been met for that. So staff's, uh, as far as the recommendation goes, um, staff recommends approval of project PUD-01-20-02 rezoning from RE residential states, RS residential suburban, and AG agricultural to PUDMR planned unit development mixed residential and a development plan for the enclave at Mill Creek, generally located in the 15600 block of Midland Drive, subject to the following conditions. One, approval by the governing body and publication of the rezoning ordinance. Two, acceptance <laughs> of the dedications on the final plat by the Shawnee governing body and recording of the plat with the Johnson County Register of Deeds Office prior to building permits being issued. Number three, a final executed declaration of covenants, restrictions, assessments, and easements for the subdivision shall be submitted along with the final plat for recording with the Register of Deeds Office. Four, the applicant shall submit a revised landscape plan for review and approval with the final plat. Five, site improvements and buildings shall be constructed as depicted on the submitted plans and detailed within the staff report. Six, all street storm and street light public improvements are required to be constructed in accordance with the development plan and, and with the standards of the Shawnee Design and Construction Manual. Seven, all site and building improvements shall be in accordance with the 2018 International Fire Code or as required by the City Fire Marshal. Eight, provisions of the excise tax shall be satisfied prior to obtaining the mayor's signature on the final plat. Nine, open space fees uh, at the current rate shall be paid at the time of a building permit is applied for prior to the issuance of a building permit. And ten, the applicant is responsible for obtaining all such permits as may be required by federal, state, and local agencies, including but not limited to the city, Johnson County Environmental Department, Kansas Department of Health and Environment, Kansas Division of Water Resources and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. That concludes staff's presentation, but I would also like to point out um, as part of um, each of you uh, in front of you should have a letter from an adjacent property owner who is adjacent to the 200 foot, within the 200 foot notification area stating their opposition to the rezoning and the reasons they stated. So if you read that and enter that into your comment, public comment. Very fine. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Is the applicant present? If you come forward and state your name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Tim Tucker, T U C K E R, with Phelps Engineering. Um, I'm representing uh, ALH LLC, the developer. Um, in addition to myself, uh, the developer, Rocky Roads, is here. Um, we agree and to uh, continue to work with staff on the landscaping and uh, a lot of the stuff they're asking for is stuff that we intended on doing foundation plantings and stuff, as you've seen from the elevations. Um, doing the inventory on the trees, no big deal. And then the uh, perimeter uh, buffering that they're asking for, we'll work with them on that. Um, we're in agreement with stipulations uh, 1 through 10 and uh, stand for any questions you may have. Does the commission have any questions for applicant or staff? Commissioner Willoughby. Uh, in the excise tax uh, section, it says there are no public street improvements associated with this project that are eligible for credit. No. Why is that? Mark Zilsdorf, City Planning Staff. Um, only the public street improvements on major on the streets that are uh, classified as a major street, such as a major collector in arterial. Um, those costs are credited back to the excise tax. There are no improvements required to Midland Drive with this project, only the interior public street, the cul-de-sac, mm -hmm. and that is a local residential street which is not eligible for credit against the excise tax. Good. Thank you. Any other questions for applicant or staff? Commissioner Peterson. I was just seeking clarification on uh, the 
at the end of the cul-de-sac, there's obviously no buildings, and that's where the trail goes out, and that's already been under deeded back to the city, perhaps for a connection to Little Mill Creek. Am I correct about that? No. Um, as part of this project, because we show the land use guide shows that is. Uh, uh, park and open space type uses is appropriate for back there and with previous developments to the east or to the west when those come in the city had acquired a 15 foot um, trail easement uh, for the potential future construction of a trail easement so in keeping with that we requested that this applicant provide that 15 foot easement across their property that would allow for that connection. There are no plans currently for a trail along Little Mill Creek, but we're obviously looking, you know, 20, 30, 40 years out um, as that area on the south side of Midland Drive continues to develop, that we would have the provisions in place to put together a trail along Little Mill Creek. Okay. Commissioner Peterson. Follow up question. Um, there's obviously been a lot of thought going into the architecture and I'm trying to do the math and maybe it's I'm having another Monday on a Wednesday but um, that's six fourplexes with three to four bedrooms plus perhaps addition of additional bedroom in the basement and three duplexes or is that just two three three that's a lot of people, and our amenities are what again? What were the amenities they are providing? Um, the amenities were a walking trail, a barbecue grill area, um, a dog area, and then um, let me see here. Walking path, seating area, community grill area, and a dog area. Um, and then in addition to that, which I think is more important, is the fact that they've got 3.3 acres of just passive open space that they can uh, use or enjoy. Um, and I think the applicant can tell you the, the market for these are probably going to be for um, probably an older clientele as opposed to a younger family clientele. Okay, and the follow-up on that question would be from you, and that would be, <clears throat> dog, is that just in the open space, or did I miss a, a line where it's... Yes, so, yes, it would be open space. So the dog park and the open space are the same thing? Yes. And is that going to be fenced? No. Gotcha, thanks. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Roth. So I, <clears throat> to follow up on Commissioner Peterson's question, are there the better are they three to four bedrooms with the option to bump up to one or two, or is it three to four total? Yes. Three to four total. Okay, so that's I think that's where okay. I was confusing. Okay, there's two bedrooms on the main living floor, and then there's the basement level has the option to um, finish out with okay, two so additional bedrooms. bedrooms. That makes that's more sense. Right. Okay, and then the second question is this uh, gated similar to the Cypress? As well, I didn't catch that piece. It's not gated. No. It, it'll be, uh, we're assuming it's going to be empty nesters. Okay. And then uh, it's maintenance provided. So. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for applicant or staff? And I believe this is not age restricted. It wasn't mentioned, but I'm sure it's not age restricted. That's correct. Okay. Any other questions for applicant or staff? If not, Thank you, Mr. Tucker. And that would put us in a public hearing. Does anybody from the public wish to come up and comment on this matter? While you're, if you'll come up here and, and state your name and address. While you're coming up here, I'm going to read the letter that we were given. It is from Edward and Linda Villanueva. It says, Dear Sirs, this letter is in regards to a correspondence I received dated 127 2000. 20 concerning the de development enclave at Mill Creek. We have been residents and homeowners in the city of Shawnee for 40 years. We have lived at the above address the entire 40 years. The north and west side of our property butts up against said development. 
Everyone on the south side of Midland Drive owns between 2 and 10 acres of property. Because of the acreages being in wooded areas and in the flood zone, it has become a habitat for wildlife. On a usual day, it is not uncommon to see deer, coyote, bob, turkey, bobcat, geese, ducks, and many other forms of wildlife. What you're asking with no regards to someone like ourselves who have been citizens and taxpayers in the city of Shawnee is to give up our tranquil lifestyle so a developer who has no history with the city to come make their money and leave. You're asking us to trade in the peaceful sounds of the night for bright lights, cars coming and going and the noise of over 100 people. In conclusion, we are against the above mentioned acreage being rezoned. Uh, they were unable to attend the meeting tonight, um, and we voted into the public comment period for Edward and Linda Bell and Rava at 1110 Johnson Drive in Shawnee. Now, let's see the address. 15503 Midland Drive in Shawnee. Excuse me. Ma'am, please. <laughs> I'm Margie Burton. Um, I live at 7108 Almond Drive, so I'm right across the street from there in the villas of Hall Garden. And I personally thought it looked beautiful, um, much better than the house that's there now. It looks like, uh, I mean, it's dangerous. I, if I had been a kid, I'd have been in that house and hurt by now. So I'm thrilled it's going to be gone. Uh, I have two questions. First of all, do you have any idea what these will sell for? Actually, you're addressing the Planning Commission. Oh, oh okay. Do you all have any idea what these are going to sell for? <laughs> we, were not, we did not ask that question, okay. nor is it necessarily relevant to what we're talking about. Okay, well, it's just yeah. relevant to those of us who have homes there that would like to know that our property right. values are going to be But one of the sad things is, it, actually, do you have an idea of what your starting price is going to be on one of these? This is developers and we, we were hoping we would be under four hundred thousand for each unit but I'm not sure what it is cost that's gonna be a reality. That's all right. Thank you stated about four hundred thousand okay. dollars per unit. And then I had one question that really isn't probably relevant but I was wondering when you figured out the per, when they figured out the three point two per acre, did that include the three to four acres of floodplain? Was that included in that Yes, I can answer that. Yes, it okay. does. So it really is, I mean, that's not usable land back there, so. It's the standard the city has always done. Is that you use the whole that acreage? You use the whole acreage, and then it's calculated out on the entirety of the acreage. Okay. All right, because I've lived there a long time, and that's really not usable. So that's both my question. All right, thank you so much. Ms. Burton, thank you very much. Does anyone else care to comment on the matter before us? Please. My name is Terry Roderick. Uh, my address is 15563 Midland Drive. Um, how long is uh, anticipated construction? Actually, we would have no idea, and I'm not sure the developer at this point in time could tell you either. Okay. The only other concern I really had would be the, I live just to the west of this property, or the east, so all of a sudden now I have eight plus duplexes right next to my yard. So my concern is what type of privacy? Is there going to be a fence or... And hopefully I've got this right, but if I remember in the comments that were made that there will be something along the edge of that property to basically kind of, and, and that will become part of the final plan, is that correct, Mark? The uh, plans that are submitted do not indicate any kind of fencing around the perimeter of this project, but staff is requesting additional landscaping in the form of plant material to be uh, added on the east and west sides of this to help buffer the adjacent properties. And that would be dealt with in the final plan? That would be dealt with in the final plan. Right. So that will probably come up, that will come up again in the final plan when that's submitted. Okay. And the last question is the very far south, um, which is flood, flood area, mm -hmm. are those trees going to be removed or is that still going to be 
forest area. I'm recalling from what they said that they're planning on keeping the majority of the trees, if not all of them. And I think what it is is that they were talking about there's an, they'll have an inventory of them, and then afterwards they will inventory them to make sure there will be. T I'm sh I'm sure in this type of situation there'll be some trees in there that may need to go away because they're not conducive to the property. But the as he said, the the intention is to keep that forested area and all those trees back there. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Roderick. Anybody else care to speak on this matter? Seeing no one come forward, then the public meeting, the public hearing is closed, and we're into commission discussion. Commissioner Willoughby. All looks good to me. Thank you. Commissioner Nanick. discussion Commissioner Peterson <clears throat> you know when I first looked at this I was a little concerned with the numbers and then we got them right in my head and so I appreciate that and um, I think the developers been here and heard that we like our trees we like to preserve as much as we can um, I understand buffers needed to shelter the existing neighbors that have taken care of their property unlike the one that you've purchased hopefully so we appreciate that uh the the amenities that i think you're going for are good but just on an outside chance you want to upgrade the dog park to an actual dog park <laughs> not a bad plan <laughs> Any further commission discussion? Sure. Commissioner Smith. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm going to lose sight of the, the Mr. Roderick's concern because I think that's that's a legitimate concern. And Mark, just for clarification, the, the letter we got from the from the Ravens, is that who it is? So they, Mr. Roderick uh, lives between the subject property and those folks, is that correct? Yeah, let me see if I can point this out here. So uh, Mr. Roderick's property is this one right here directly to the east. Uh, the gentleman that you got the uh, letter from, he actually lives in this address, and his property comes down and actually includes this piece back that's here. Right. Yeah, that's right. When he said it, you know. So his piece actually is adjacent to this back here. Yeah, that's where he gets his west and north property is right. contiguous. I mean, I understand what they're saying, and I, I can fully respect what they're saying, but if the developer does what the developer says he's going to do, there's going to be no doubt some impact. I'm familiar with that from uh, Kenneth Smith property. We have wildlife running up and down the street now every day looking for some place to go. Um, I, and I just wanted to address their concerns since they took time to, to write the letter, but, I, you know, uh, in my mind, yeah, there's, it's probably a minimal impact visually anyway. I understand what they're saying, but unfortunately that... Uh, that's progress. So I think the project looks great, very well thought out. Um, boy, is there a need for such things in Shawnee? I just wish somebody would build them cheap enough that I could afford one. That's all, Mr. Chairman. We remain in commission discussion. Any 
further discussion? If not, will someone care to make a motion? Commissioner Wise? I'll make a motion that we approve PUD 01 20 02, the Enclave of Mill Creek at 15625 Midland Drive, resuming for planned unit development, uh, per staff's recommendations, and the revisions Mark noted. Is there a second? Commissioner Montgomery? Second to motion. There's a motion and a second for approval of PUD 01 02, the Enclave of Mill Creek at 15625 Mill. Midland Drive, rezoning for planned unit development per staff recommendations and additions. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, and please start as soon as you can. <laughs> that puts us into other business, which we are going to hear a presentation on the reimagining of 75th Street study. Of which Mr. Doug Almond is going to do this. I'm afraid to do it, I'm afraid I'll lose it. And he has forewarned me that, uh, by the way, we're kind of godfathers now. You know that, don't you? <laughs> godfathers. I, I, I'm going to do my best. This was, Stephanie, I think, was planning. Stephanie is a proud mother as of yesterday uh, morning of a baby girl. Wow. <laughs> so she, she's I about a week and a half for two weeks early. So I she think planned on being here. They have cigars for us after this meeting. Well, she had the baby yesterday. <laughs> wow. Awesome. wow. Probably see it. Okay. It's fine, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Doug had, Doug had advised me that he isn't, yeah. this has really been Stephanie's deal, so he isn't up to date on every piece and part of this. So be uh, I'll give it my best shot. If you have questions that we can't answer or I can't answer, I can certainly. Doug, you're used to you. We know you're good, so we'll probably <laughs> not know this. I, I know the history of it because it's, it's interesting that uh, – Vicki Charlesworth's last kind of directive as interim city manager, uh, we have a $3.4 million capital improvement project that we're going to be spending that's budgeted, it's been approved to do a corridor plan and uh, to do corridor improvements down on 75th Street. And she came to me and said, you know, you've been pretty good at writing these grants through the Mid-America Regional Council. You think you can write a grant, maybe get some money and do some planning before we do this capital plan? Of course, she came to me about a week and a half before the grant was due, as usual. And I said, well, yeah, I think we can throw something together. And, and actually, we leveraged about $60,000 from the Mid-America Regional Council to do the study. So I know the front end of it. Uh, but when Stephanie took over my role, she kind of ran this through the consultant. But what they did was come up with a really good plan and vision for both some short-term uh, wins and some longer-term implementation-type plans that we can do as this corridor number one is redeveloped in the next year. I think 2021 is when the, the uh, signalization and geometric improvements at the intersections and some of the lane uh, configurations are going to be changed, new curbs, sidewalks, those kind of things. But there's also some longer term visioning type things that maybe we can do as we get redevelopment in, in parts of the corridor. There are some buildings down there that were built in the 50s and 60s and have outlived their livelihood. And so that through this uh, this plan, they've came up with some reconfiguration of some partials and things. So I'll buzz through this uh, PowerPoint that was presented actually at a council committee meeting. The consultant did a wonderful job of presenting this, and I apologize, I will not do nearly as good a job as what uh, that person did. Uh, so we hired train systems to do the study. The study area was basically Schweitzer Road, which is our eastern city limit, over to Quivira. And then back in, I think we did about a quarter mile offset because we're also looking at connectivity uh, the, to these, this heavy, heavily residential area. This is our most dense apartment corridor in the city. It's on the south side of 75th Street. And there are bus stops along there as well. So the study's purpose, and this was right out of the grant, was to improve bicycle and pedestrian connections, enhance bus stops to encourage transit, beautify with new streetscape amenities. It's a very hardscaped area now, and it's almost like Neiman was before. If you walk those sidewalks and a bus goes by, it's not a real pleasant feeling. And so the idea was to try to come up without increasing right-of-way or doing a lane diet through some new lane configurations 
provide more room for uh, trail and pedestrian and, and bike connections along 75th. And then the last one I kind of talked about earlier was integrate future redevelopment opportunities. And so this was something that, because it goes through Mark, but also because at the staff level, we, we really are trying to get into a method of community engagement. We don't want these to be staff plans, we want them to be city plans, we want them to be stakeholder plans, we want them to be residents plans, we want them to have say. So we did an open house, and I, I know 30 probably doesn't sound like many, but for an open house, for a public uh, corridor type study, 30 attendees, interacting with boards is good. We also had an online survey that had 650 responses. Uh, that was a visual preference survey, essentially. Uh, we had another public open house to kind of take back what the plan was formulating to. Had another 60 attendants there, uh, and, and then another 160 responses. It was interactive, and through that pedestrian or that uh, preference, visual preference survey, they began to hone in on what residents, stakeholders, users of that corridor kind of wanted, what they wanted to see. And, and what you'll see is percentages of what people thought would be a good idea. So the preference for improving the existing condition down there is an eight-foot path with a four-foot buffer on both sides of the road. And that is considered multi-use, which is wonderful. You can have someone potentially on a bike, you can have someone pushing a stroller, and they'll be able to pass each other without having to get out into the roadway. Um, as you can see, there was other bike walk connection uh, opportunities that they thought about. Uh, one of the priorities of the study was our famous get to Turkey Creek again. We have this wonderful amenity in the city of Merriam. We have a great partnership in working with the city of Merriam. Uh, and the goal, as always, is to get from our Blackfish Parkway Park, uh, Streamway Park and Trail, over to the trail system that can get you uh, almost all the way down to Kansas City, Missouri, I believe. And so they came up with some um, options to do that. Uh, there's a short-term option and a long-term option. The preferred option was actually, I believe, to go under the bridge uh, at 75th and I-35 to get there. Um, that is an expensive option, so that would probably be more of a long-term implementation type thing. But at least we've studied it, and we know that the grades are there, and it's possible to do. Interesting thing about doing a connection like that, there may be more grant money available to, to, to build that someday. And so we're going to explore that. Uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, one of the things that came out of the study, uh, Shawano, as you guys remember, was recently rebuilt, uh, repositioned. There's a lot of students that walk from those apartments to Schwano. 71% uh, of those surveyed think that it would be much safer to have a mid block crossing with that pedestrian safety zone that Neil talked about for the park. Putting one of those in with some low shrubs to warn people that there might be someone standing there, but at the same time not blocking visibility. And so a mid block crossing at the existing, with a median at the existing signal is what was preferred. And there's a good likelihood that as those capital plans are done, that'll be incorporated. That's a, that's a short-term thing that's not expensive to do and can be accomplished. Uh, another thing that they explored is the public to private path connections. So if we're going to have an eight-foot multimodal path on both sides of the road, you have those existing apartment complexes that really had no thought to connectivity back when they were built. And so they explored, and actually your son worked in identifying some of these uh, locations early on before we even started working with the consultant, and what that drew up to was some, there's a section in the plan the full plan is attached to the, the agenda tonight. Feel free to read all 78 pages of it. It's very enlightening. Uh, this is a very quick overview of it. But they have different connections and, and pretty inexpensive ways of getting people directly from those apartment complexes to the, the public way. And that's all shown in, in the document. Transit facilities, uh, they came up with um, the prioritization of improvements that could be made. 50% of the people said that the standard shelter was fine. 73% wanted that path behind the shelter. So essentially, you have the shelter right up on the road, the pathway behind, so that the shelter didn't interfere, interfere with walkers and bikers on the street. Um, they, the usage uh, of those shelters, it's probably going to be this one, and I believe this one, that will end up being done first. There was some discussion in the Kansas City Star that the Neiman line was potentially going to go away because of lack of ridership. 
Um, Stephen actually is heavily connected into the KCATC, KCATA, um, and that is not necessarily true. Uh, we are still going to have Neiman service. Uh, they'll basically just reroute uh, one of the bus routes that are cut. Um, I kind of talked about this. The priority bus locations are these are highlighted here. And these are the highest point of pickup. Um, and they prioritize those by ridership, right-of-way availability, coordination potential, and multi-use amenities. So right now there are stops. Literally, you can see the sign. There's a stop right on the roadway with a very, very small buffer on a four-foot sidewalk. That will be changed dramatically after this project's done. Um, so the, so the, the thought is to, if you're going to have transit stops, have them be usable and safe. Streetscape amenities, this is really kind of, I think, what Vicki was thinking about when I, I first kind of said, hey, maybe we can do this, and she said yeah, that, you know, we can have left to the deadline, let's do this. I think we we're really thinking more about amenities. They came up with some ideas in terms of uh, intersection plannings. Uh, I don't like to call them park-a-parks, park park but uh, material pockets at intersections that are drought tolerant, um, enhanced pedestrian lighting, install uh, street trees, uh, just really to enhance the visual interest. And then they've talked about you know, some of the short-term potential um, project impacts would be just at spot location and limited impact areas. Those are basically in the orange areas. The thought long-term would hopefully, as redevelopment occurs, begin to really fill in with a good street scape canopy and start to make it look more like a boulevard. It's very, very much concrete and asphalt now. There's not much landscaping down there at all. And it, it, it looks very, very hard. Um, streetscape amenities, again, for improving intersection safety. Uh, and this is going to happen. We can reconfigure the major, major intersections based on existing traffic counts and anticipated future traffic generations. On Neiman, they've recommended that they remove the dedicated eastbound right turn lane. Uh, at Covira, install a dedicated dual westbound turn lane. Uh, I'm not a traffic expert. I wish Deanna was here to explain it. Uh, Kevin, our traffic manager, was heavily involved with Stephanie and the group on all of these recommendations. And I know that even before this study was done, they were looking at signal changes and some geometric changes at these intersections because of safety and, and honestly, uh, queuing needs. Uh, first priority is pedestrian lighting, directional curb ramps, corner landscaping, and then the fourth out of that preference survey was, survey was decorative crosswalks. So each of these costs money. <laughs> so as budget allows, we'll work our way down the prioritization list. Uh, if, if anything, at least we'll have some decorative lighting and pedestrian lamps and things down there to help people who will want to hopefully be walking after dark when you get more new apartments, restaurants, and those kind of things happening, especially at Quivira and 75th. Uh, the last thing that came out from a streetscape amenity standpoint, if you guys are aware, Southern Star has a large transfer station at 75th and Neiman. It's basically a big wood fence with barbed wire at the top of it. It's ugly. Uh, it's, it's, right, <laughs> it's right up on the sidewalk. Uh, so they came up and took this through a, another visual preference exercise. And 42% of those 600 plus respondents say that a 42% uh, said a solid or decorative masonry wall would be nice. Uh, maybe using part of that amenity as a seating bench on the corner, incorporating some mural art and maybe a city logo, obviously breaking up the mass of that wall by changing height and, and texture. Um, that is not cheap, but it's not something that's so unreasonable that it can't be done. Uh, and possibly, again, working with Southern Star, there might be some grant money available to build that. And this is the last portion of the, the redevelopment opportunities. You've got uh, large centers. You've got areas that are, as I said, sometimes 50, 60-year-old buildings. And what they came up with is that build forward concept that we're using on Neiman. As buildings become dilapidated or, or literally it, the, the math makes sense to tear them down and redevelop. We'd be looking at build, moving the buildings forward to the street, doing parking, shared parking behind, uh, and doing some consolidated access as development allowed. 
uh, right now you have multiple, multiple, multiple driveways in many cases, and that creates a danger problem for pedestrians and cars. The thought would be to try to come up with uh, as many shared driveway access and control points as we could as redevelopment occurs. Again, a summary, <laughs> uh, improved bicycle pedestrian connections. I think that if you read that study, they came up with some very good recommendations to do that without, again, acquiring, acquiring right-of-way or doing a lane diet, anything like that. The function of the street will remain the same because it does carry, I believe, about 35 to 40,000 cars a day. Enhancing those bus stops that we talked about, beautifying with new streetscape amenities, pedestrian benches, lighting, plantings, and then uh, again integrating that future redevelopment opportunity uh, as properties become available for the redevelopment. So, the purpose of this was again was just for information. I think some of you maybe even participated in the surveys or went to the open house. I hope you did. Um, if you didn't, um, the book is really good. And I'd encourage you to look at it in detail. And if you have questions specifically out of that, if I don't know the answer, I know that Kevin Manning, our, our transportation manager, will. Thank you, Doug. Mm -hmm. Does the commission have any questions for Doug on the presentation of 75th Street? Kathy does. Commissioner Peterson. <laughs> well, they threw me under the bus there. My, my biggest question is, <laughs> What is the speed limit in that section? I know that that is a through street, and it appears that our redevelopment is wanting to make it like downtown on Neiman. And this is a I'm not sure. I believe it's a 35 mile hour zone now. Obviously, there's a school I think that goes down to either 20 or 25 when the when schools letting out and 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 and. and in session opening up. I don't think the intent here would be to change any speed limits. This is a major carrier. Uh, the reason it's a major bus route is, is because there's so much traffic and density down there now. This isn't an, a corridor that's ever going to look like Neiman. Uh, there were some residents who were very concerned that the city was trying to take this to a three-lane section. It simply will fail at a three-lane section. If the three-lane sections basically can handle 15 to 20,000 cars, this is already at 35 to 40, and it's probably only going to go up as redevelopment occurs. And so that is why they are looking specifically at Covera and Schweitzer for some geometric changes. I don't think they're getting the turn movement efficiency that they can mm -hmm. maximize now. And so some of, a, a large portion, not a large, a significant portion of that funding for that capital plan will be for those intersections to be redesigned and, and reconfigured. Okay. But the speed limit, I believe, will stay the same. Commissioner Wise. Quick question. In the report, I think it indicated that the, the, the eight-foot area, four-foot buffer was only on the south side. But you mentioned both sides. I thought it was uh, both sides. Can you go back to that? But no, I was trying to remember because one of the diagrams showed it like okay, side one correct. side. Five, five on the. You are correct. I thought when I said that that seemed like overkill. <laughs> well, I mean, because I think one of the most important things is going to be trying to figure out those crossings because those do happen a lot. But as you know, with that that amount of traffic, those those crossings are going to be really important. Oh, yeah. Just at the school, but trying to get people across. The challenge is it doesn't matter which side you put it on in the apartments, the dense the density is on the south side, I believe, like it you is. said. So that's where you want it. But then of course you've got that whole strip mall on the north side, but you're gonna have to cross no matter what. Doesn't matter where you put it. And and some of it I I think this is true. There were some to do the wider path on the south, I believe there was some interference with utility poles and utility relocates that would have to occur. So they looked at that in detail. I think what they ended up doing was just trying to make it fit in the best that they could with the existing. Uh, the, the, one of the long-term things that you read in there is actually taking those power poles underground. But again, that's about probably about a million to two million dollar endeavor. So it'll be some time. We've, we've learned our lessons on Neiman about taking power underground on streets that are 60 years old. Um, but no, that's a good, I appreciate you pointing that out because you're correct. It's a, taking the four foot to a five foot, which is a much better, even that one foot is a giant difference. Uh, we're, we're actually, as a city, our new policy is any new sidewalk construction in the city is five foot rather than four. 
uh, we've decided to take over that maintenance burn, burden long term just because of the benefit. Uh, and then the eight foot shared use path uh, on, on the opposite side. Part of that too, I think, was possibly trying to get the multimodal path over to Turkey Creek and prioritizing the easiest place to cross and get over there. Was, so that, that set the side of the street somewhat too, where the, where the wider path went. Oh, it's safer. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of congestion, especially in AM and PM peak. Uh, weekend, maybe not as bad, but it's a very busy area down there. People, not only flights are safe, fit, but trying to get on the interstate is very, very busy. Any other questions for Doug? Especially when they start construction. So, Mr. On there. One comment. So, Hayward's Barbecue finally gets an entrance off a of reader. <laughs> you know, we've been working with them forever and have told them go ahead and do it and then they go to look at doing it and they realize there's a four to five foot drop so you have to have retaining walls on opposite sides and the cost goes up a little bit but really not much in development terms and they say no we don't want to pay for a retaining wall so then we're left with one access point on to 75th but they need, a, they need to punch one through on the reader and we've actually went to the extent of drawing up a plan for them and having it graded out at our expense because we want it to happen, but we're not going to pay for it. <laughs> to that point, though, I mean, it is a safety concern. I mean, coming in and out of there is not, and during busy or at night when it's dark, that is that has always been a challenge coming yeah, in and out of there. So, I mean, I, I'm not asking the city, suggesting the city should pay for it, but do whatever you can to make it as... We've encouraged it by as much as we can, and even with the extent of drawing, literally having our folks downstairs spend our time to draw some plans right. just to see that it was feasible. But hopefully, I, I, we had these discussions some time ago before they found out that they were going to make it. I think they're doing really well. So they may see after a year or two, they'll have some capital built up that they'll be, because I'm sure they're hearing it from their customers daily. Yeah. Why can't I <laughs> take a right or a left turn on a reader to get back with the signal? It They're seems to be doing well as far as just no, cars in the parking lot. Yeah. So yeah. part of that too is they have an owner who, and I'm not saying a bad thing. It's the truth. Has won't won't commit to putting a dime into that property because I think at one point it was his feeling that the property had lived its longest use and could be torn down. And we've seen proposals for other new buildings there even. So and there's a hesitancy on the on the prop, actual property owners. Part to, to put any more money into it. We're happy they're doing well. I've been there, we've been there several times. Just real quick, so has the this development uh, getting out into the development world has it has it drawn any attention to the area to bring additional uh, things that we're already aware besides the brewery there or anything like that? Oh, this is I would we I would say that? this is just new enough that. Okay. We just had the study accepted, I think, by the council last Tuesday. They are now, we're, I think when this will maybe trigger some redevelopment down there, like at hopefully Neiman and 75th where the old car wash is at, or maybe uh, the old, I think it was a Taco Bell that's down further east. Some of those properties, there's an old strip mall down there that's that's probably seen its, its highest and best days. Once this goes Isn't up, there in Overland Park right down there? No. Didn't they switch over to Overland Park there? And no, another no, block then. Yeah, we, we go all the way to the quick trip. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is just now in the design phase. We're going to be putting this out for bid for the actual major street reconstruction. I think once it's beautified, new curb gutter, paths, lane configurations, geometry, you get hopefully 300 and some apartments built at Westbrook Green. I think that's when the, 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 the green light maybe will happen for some of this, kind of like what we've seen on Neiman. We've had incredible interest on Neiman now that the road is almost done. I have a feeling it'll follow the same, the same path. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Doug? If not, then does the staff have anything for the commissioners? Uh, I think most of you do. I, hate it. I feel bad, but... Naomi has her name. Naomi Pearl. Pearl? Uh-huh. Uh, I can read this to you. 
uh, born 2 18 2020 at 8 43 a.m., 7 pounds 12 ounces, 21 and a quarter inch long. I don't know if you guys can see that. I can bring it up. <laughs> Uh, beautiful. Uh, baby and mother are doing fine. Everybody's doing good. good. And Angie had her final surgeries Tuesday as well. And she is resting and recovering in the hospital for probably now two more days, and then she'll be home two, three weeks, and then God willing, she'll be done with her journey. So be great. That's so awesome. we're all excited about that, and she'll be back Angie's probably full time, yeah. full time, full time, full time, end of March. Terrific. Basically, a, a, a year, right at a year of, uh, of her original diagnosis. So, it's been quite a year for her. More than I would. At this point in time, does the commission have anything for the staff? Only that I said very jokingly that if she had her baby yesterday, why she wasn't here today. And I got nailed on something like that once because the minutes don't reflect the year. So I want to apologize for that. So you needed us to laugh when you said that. Was that <laughs> loudly, right? very loudly. Yes. Let's laugh. Yes. So let me retract that statement. I hope she takes twelve weeks plus. Is that that? I get here. Mark doesn't agree with you. No. Okay. But congratulations to her. At this point in time, would somebody care to make a motion for adjournment? Mr. Chairman, please, Commissioner Smith. We add June. Second. Second by Commissioner Nemec. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. We're done. Thank you. Thanks for your patience on sure. Hey, Doug. I came to see you at 3 o'clock yesterday. <laughs> they said, they said, um, they've been in the meeting. Uh, well, oh, yeah. 3.30. Oh, yeah. 3.30. Nope. My thing. Norman came out of the meeting, walked down to the office one night and said, Crosswalk, is it over yet? That's what we're saying. She said, it's I am. I know there is some way you could do a bridge. Because, well, I just said the other thing too. I mean, this guy, it seems like almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They may get some credit on this one about that. So if they. Which is a major uh, they do get credits uh, right. Hey Dennis. <coughs> Thank you, Doug. I gotta get him. Hey, Dennis. Oh. Hey, I'm riding with him. <laughs> I better get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> See, Mark.